good morning from my world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Markets remain on edge after Wall Street's plunge yesterday. The dollar continues with dominance. A mixed bag of China data adds to the broad risk aversion in the markets. Plus, Morgan Stanley and Bank of America wrap up the earnings parade today of the big U.S. banks. So we are grappling with a higher rates, geopolitics, China disappointing in the growth data for March. And how does that play out to markets? Well, as Danny said this morning, finally, <laughs> the equity markets are catching up with the bond markets. We had a pretty torturous day yesterday, uh, down nearly 1.8% on U.S. equities. We're stabilizing ever so slightly this morning. But again, that yield spike at four, up 14 basis points at one juncture yesterday really invected a repricing in the equity narrative. UBS throws a wrench into the thinking uh, that rates may well have to or could possibly there's a fly in a kite of six and a half percent from UBS what would that do to equities down between 10 to 15 percent suddenly we need to understand what will the reprisal be from Israel to Iran they stand ready the language will play you their language a little bit later but a more severe a faster a more immediate blow will be leveled by the Israelis on the Iranians take yourself to Europe Europe and Asia uh, and Australasia all playing the catch-up game with the sell-off here in the United States so that's that's why it looks a lot more visceral in Europe relative to the rest of the board this morning. You're looking at the uh, material producers are down because of the disappointing March data from China. So the materials element down 2.86% in Europe this morning. But Europe plays the catch up to America's sell off yesterday on the rates bounce. Well, it might be a sell off in American stocks, but it is the dollar manis which is dominating, is clobbering its way through all of the major currencies. It is stronger against all of them. Bloomberg dollar spot up to tenths of 1%. The Bank of Indonesia had to step in after the rupiah fell to a four year low. The yuan, we also saw job boning there after hitting a two-year low. EMFX is at its lowest levels of the year. It is dollar strength on rates, on geopolitics, on haven, and also China setting a weaker-than-expected fix this morning. Manis, you mentioned the yields, the jump yesterday, eight basis points. We are up. 43 basis points so far this month, the highest since November. It has been a huge climb. Brent crude takes a breather this morning after gaining. We're still at $90 a barrel, up 18% this year, even with a climbing dollar. So that is remarkable. But man, it's a lot of what's happening in Brent crude, of course, is geopolitics. But we've really been focusing on crude in terms of the fallout, not the wider markets. Sonia Martin of DZ Bank, who we're going to speak with later in the show, puts it really well that investors don't even want to imagine what the fallout is from risk of es escalation, which is why markets have been calm. But once you look at the white of the eyes of the top Israeli officials saying we have no choice but to respond, it's not just imagination anymore. It is reality. And here is the reality. It is the differential between the West G7's understanding of what they want versus Israel and Iran. Two very different uh, viewpoints. And if you look at the language from the deputy Iranian foreign minister, this is what he talks about. He talks about a more severe, faster, and more immediate blow. And it is the differential. If you look at what Macron is saying, we want yes. to avoid flare-ups. So there is this chasm, and there always has been this chasm between the West and that of the Middle East in terms of a comprehension of what is needed to be delivered from both sides. Yes, the rules of engagements have changed. It went from a conflict in the shadows between Iran and Israel to out in the forward. And despite managed the U.S. and its allies, as you say, urging yeah. Israel to restrain from responding to the Iranian attacks, the Israeli Defense Force's chief of staff reasserted that the country has no choice. We are closely assessing the situation. We remain at our highest level of readiness. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. The IDF remains ready to counter any threat from Iran and its terror proxies. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Golnar Motivali, who covers the Middle East and Iran. Um, so Golnar... We had yesterday CNN reporting that there was a meeting of the Israeli defense chiefs, the cabinet, it ends, and they review options for a strike, but no conclusive conclusion as to whether or not they will do it. Where does the risk stand of an Israeli strike against Iran and what might it look like? 
Well, as you said, those meetings were, were um, inconclusive and we've heard from the Israelis that they definitely have to respond as we've seen, as we just saw from that clip from Halevi, um, from the, the IDF uh, um, spokesman. And what I think that's where the big question mark is now, is, is Israel going to listen to these calls from the United States and the West and its other European allies urging it to, to act with restraint? Um, and I think what we're seeing so far, I think, are some sort of notes that hint more to that. So we also had a spokesman, Peter Lerner, tell us on, on Bloomberg Radio earlier that, that Israel is going to act with patience and it's going to take its time to review all its options. Um, and if you put that alongside the statement from the deputy um, Iranian foreign minister, Bar Erikani, that you just quoted, you know, he's saying that we will act within seconds, we will strike stronger, more immediately, harsher. I think both of them, uh, th th there's a sense there that neither of them wants a big escalation. But obviously Israel has to or it needs to give the impression that it has to act somehow. I don't think it can allow Iran to set a precedent to hit these direct strikes and at the same time it kind of works in um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's favour and his very hardline Israeli cabinet to keep the world's attention away from Gaza, away from the massive civilian death toll that's been wrought on the destruction that we've seen in that um, enclave. It suits them to actually keep the attention and the world's focus away from that. And, well, where, Donna, and, and the, the, the next move by Israel, to what extent must that be verbally backed by Joe Biden, which he talked about an ironclad support for Israel? So whatever Israel does, it needs to be calibrated with a tacit support from the US? Well, that's also, um, that's also an interesting um, point because we've seen the US, obviously, US is a very, very staunch ally of Israel. And it has said that, as you said, it's the ironclad support for Israel's need and um, right to defend itself will always be there and it will be steadfast. But they also made a point of saying that they won't support an offensive strike on Iran. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, when it comes to it, we also saw on Saturday night when Iran did strike Iran, that the US did scramble to its aid very quickly. Um, and so um, maybe Netanyahu will choose to call Biden's bluff on that. and. The U.S. may be forced to actually, um, they have lots of assets, obviously, military bases in the region to actually come to Israel's help and support if it does choose to strike Iran directly. Okay, Golna, thank you very much. We'll track the situation closely. Golna Motovali there. Joining Danny and I this morning is Octavio uh, Marenzi, co-CEO and founder of OpenMess. Octavio, good to have you with us. The world grapples with a lack of, I suppose, a lack of belief that we could go to an even higher escalation here. When you look at market reaction, when you look at the deep concerns of markets, um, what is your take over the past 48, 72 hours? Well, I think my take is that the Iranian attack seemed to be very carefully calibrated and they were very careful to only hit military installations. They looked to not cause any casualties. Uh, it seemed they'd be very, very careful indeed about not escalating this any further. So it seems to me the Iranians have sent a clear signal they do not want further escalation. Uh, I think the Israelis in likelihood will not uh, have too much of a, a response to this. After all, no one was killed. We basically shot down a bunch of different drones and things of that sort. So I, I don't expect to see too much fallout from this. I'm quite optimistic about that. Uh, far more optimistic than most of the pessimists are on this. I think this establishes a, a, a sort of a slightly new balance of power between Iran and Israel. Iran has demonstrated they can strike within Israel at will and hit almost anything they want there. So Israel is going to have to be very measured and quite careful in his response. And that might be a good thing to not escalate this any further. Would you say then, Octavia, what we've seen from markets over the past 24 hours, one of a strengthening dollar, one of yields marching higher, that none of that is geopolitical risk. And instead, it's, it's, it's simple and clear reaction to the fact that we are underprepared for a Fed whose next move might be a hike rather than a cut. I've been talking about a, a Fed hike for some time now, and I've been very lonely on that point. And so I'm happy to see other people join me now a bit and saying that if you look at all the parameters, all the variables, 
on a macroeconomic level in the US, they all indicate or point towards actually a rate hike rather than a cut. So unemployment re remains low, uh, GDP growth remains strong, the markets are at or near all-time highs, so that's pretty, you know, we come down a bit now the past couple of days, but we're still pretty near that. So there's nothing really out there that would suggest a big rate cut is necessary. In fact, it looks the opposite direction. Core inflation is still twice what the Fed would like it to be. So I think all the indicators point towards a hike rather than a cut, or at least delaying the cut for as long as possible. So I don't expect to see any cuts this year, maybe so that was the tail end of the year, depending on what happens. But I think all the indicators point in the opposite direction, have been pointing in the opposite direction for some time now. And that itself has really interesting implications for the bank. Some good if you're a large bank, some bad if you're regional. Octavio, stay with us because we're going to discuss just that. Octavio Morenzi of Opimas. But first, let's get to some of the other stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. House Speaker Mike Johnson plans separate votes this week on new aid to Israel and Ukraine. The move could end a month's long Republican blockade on help for Kyiv, while also responding quickly to Iran's missile and drone attack in Israel. Johnson said, quote, the world is watching us to see how we'll react as he announced the plan. Former President Donald Trump's first criminal trial got off to a slow start with the proceedings stalling over disagreements about evidence and other last minute arguments. The first day concluded with no jurors picked and proceedings will resume today. Trump, who is accused of falsifying records to hide hush money, has railed against the case for months and denies wrongdoing. Xi Jinping is pushing back against European and U.S. pressure to rein in the country's powerhouse industries. The Chinese le leader told his German counterpart that a surge in Chinese clean tech exports has helped the world tackle inflation. Xi's co comments to Chancellor Olaf Scholz during talks in Beijing suggest China may not be swayed in any meaningful way by the German leader. Coming up, disappointing data from China. And Morgan Stanley and Bank of America prepared to report before the bell after Goldman's strong quarter. We'll discuss with Octavio next here on Bloomberg Brief. It's Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York. Earnings se season is kicked off with a bang and a whimper, I guess. The big banks have reported, and it was a bang for Goldman. It was a blowout quarter. And after them, it's time for Morgan Stanley and Bank of America to step up to the plate today. We're back with Octavio Morenzi, co-CEO and founder of Opima. So, Octavio, we had Goldman yesterday. Investment banking and trading was strong. The OG powerhouses of Goldman Sachs showed up to a big degree. Is this validation of Solomon's reboot? Well, listen, they did well across the board. All lines of business were basically up. And even if you dig further down, everything was looking really good. I think it's still a long way to go back to the glory days, though. If you look at their return on equity currently, it's just under 15 percent. That's well, well below where it was at its peak, where it's sort of in the mid to high 20s. So there's still some way to go, but they're certainly on the right path. I will say about investment banking, we saw investment banking revenues at Goldman come up about 35% year on year in this quarter. But bear in mind, the past couple of years in investment banking have been pretty bad. So uh, there's signs of life there. It's moving in the right direction, but it's still much, much lower than it has been historically. So I would say, yes, it is validation of Goldman Sachs' approach. It seems to be working. They have focused on the correct businesses and, and seem to be capitalizing on that. But their profitability is still quite a bit below where it was in its heyday. In terms of the investment banking, the fixed income side, I mean, the, the news flow was good. It, it shows improvement. But the risk is that we started this year with such ferocity in debt capital markets, equity capital markets, IPOs and M&A. But the risk is with these geopolitical wins and with the Fed re-rating is that some of this momentum fades. That's absolutely definitely a risk. So we might well see the IPO market dry up again if geopolitical risks come into the fore and the markets come back down. But so far, it seems to be holding quite, quite steady. And bear in mind, there's quite a long runway before you take a company public, before you t do an IPO. So basically, these deals start to come into the pipeline at least a year beforehand. So they're very reluctant then to pull them back. There's a lot of work and effort that goes into them. And sometimes these companies do, really do need the capital. So sometimes there's really no choice. You have to do something. You have to raise debt or equity or something to keep financing yourself. So I think, yes, we might see a bit of a pullback. But I think the investment banking activity looks set to continue 
continue. We've seen a lot of interest in mergers and acquisitions. Mm. Uh, debt issuance remains surprisingly strong and equities issuance uh, much, much better than before. Well, we've, we really hear time after time again over so far, let's say this year, when Manus and I have conversations with people in private credit, that banks are coming and they're showing up in a big way, starting to come back from the market share that they lost, that these banks want to have a strong balance sheet that they can start investing from again. Is Octavio, is that trend real at a time when you also have increased regulation? Can the two of those coexist? Well, I, I might take slight issue with the premise of your question that mm. the banks have basically departed and were not lending that much. If you look at the overall balance sheets, certainly the U.S. banks, they never really declined. So lending has continued to be very good and very Not active. They certainly have and lost market basic... share to private capital. Yes, they've, they've lost market share because other people have come in and started lending more. But it's not as if the banks pulled back. I mean, they're, they're lending pretty much as, uh, as much as they can. So there has not been a decline in bank lending overall. Other people have started to lend even more. Uh, and they've been drawn into the higher interest rates that they can get through private credit instead of uh, investing in the public markets or, or buying bonds or things of that sort. So, yes, there's definitely been a reduction in market share. However, their absolute level has continued to increase and increase perhaps as, as quickly as they're comfortable doing. Uh, Octavia, today we get Bank of America. I'm, I'm curious, you, you say mortgage lending, which year on year is flat. I mean, some of the some of the, the, the tail risks are beginning to become more manifest, which is mortgage lending, commercial lending, flat. How important is that to the Bank of America scenario? Well, Bank of America is a very diversified institution. So it's got a very big wealth and asset management arm. It's got a pretty decent investment banking arm. It's a very well diversified uh, bank, unlike someone like Wells Fargo, who's more exposed to, to mortgages. But we did see some positive activity on the mortgage front, mortgage origination as well at Wells Fargo. So I think if we look at Bank of America, I would expect them to follow pretty much lock and step with JP Morgan in the sense that they have a fairly, fairly similar exposure there. Now, JP Morgan did very, very well when it announced uh, last week, but the, the stock price got clobbered for reasons I don't quite understand. It seemed that Jamie Dimon delivered a very, very good set of results, uh, but the market just decided to punish him. But I would expect to see Bank of America follow very, very closely in terms of that. There might be some differences in, in certain lines of business. But I think the overall story is that net, net interest margin has sort of stabilized, lending activity is up, the outflow of deposits that we saw going on has stabilized as well. And I think most importantly, the uh, provisions for loan losses yep. that some of the bank had put aside seem to have been too high. So the two major factors that determine how much banks put aside is basically the unemployment rate and GDP growth. And both those figures have been very, very strong. So I think these banks are saying, well, last quarter, we, we put a bit too much money away because mm -hmm. we were too pessimistic about where the US economy is going. I just want to get a very quick response to this. We, we have this story that UBS may face a higher hit on capital requirements. Um, one of the politicians is talking about 25 billion, 15, 25 billion in additional capital. How onerous would that be to the Amati Kalaher message, which is dividends and buybacks are back? How onerous would that kind of a capital, additional capital requirement be to that systemically important bank? Well, I know the Swiss finance minister came out with this announcement now saying something between 15 and 25 billion. Of course, if they have to raise that much more money, then basically dividends and buybacks are out the door. They basically have to go to the markets and try and raise that money. But I'm not quite sure how they've come to that conclusion just yet. I mean, most recently, the UBS balance sheet looked very, very strong. They seem to have very good capital reserves, uh, seem to be doing fine. So I'm not sure where this number has come from. We'll have to look at some of the more details there. But this sounds like a, a very strange way to announce this, too, that it comes through the finance minister saying that UBS is going to need this kind of capital injection. Usually that's not the channel that that comes from, but we'll we'll see what, uh, what they have come up with and why they're making that argument. Indeed. Uh, well, it is a hot political issue on Banhofstrasse in terms of the size of UBS. Now, Ottavio, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Ottavio Marenzi of Opamis on the banks. We're counting down to those numbers. We'll bring them to you throughout the day on Bloomberg. Bloomberg Brief, I'm Manish Cranny, alongside Danny Berger in New York. Now, as equities asphyxiate, yields spike, where do you hide? City would say that that is? Gold. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> $3,000 is the call.
from City, and that is in the next 18 months. I mean, that's a whopper. What you just said yesterday, we made another record high yeah. in yesterday's trade. So we've come back a little bit, and you can hardly call that a drawdown. Half of 1%. I mean, City for sure has one of the highest price targets, but it's, it's not crazy. Goldman saying it's 2,700, calling it an unshakable bull market. UBS says 2,500. And there's buying across the board, whether it's managed money players, consumers in China have been buying massively, and central banks have also been buying a lot. China, India, all of them are gorging on gold. Gorging on gold. There you <laughs> I know go. you they, like that alliteration. Yeah, I, do quite, I actually do quite <laughs> like that alliteration. I mean, whether it's the Fed cutting cycle is delayed, whether it's a potential recession, is an inflation hedge. I mean, there's a whole myriad of reasons, but they're coming in for that. But there is one alpha in this market, and it is the dollar. Yeah. This, is, this is an example of where you go to in times of great distress. The dollar is mighty uh, at the moment. Um, and perhaps HSBC have a big note out, Danny, uh, on what you want to do. Aussie and the Kiwi look dire mm. on the Fed and geopolitical risk. I mean, the dollar's just clobbering its way through everything stronger against all G10. We're going to discuss just that with Sonia Martin of DZ Bank. Up next, the context that matters on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Anna Scranny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger. Here's what you need to know. Markets remain on edge. Wall Street plunged yesterday while the dollar continues its dominance. It's a mixed bag of China data and it adds to the broad risk aversion in markets. Plus, Morgan Stanley and Bank of America wrap up the earnings parade today of the big banks. So we get more banks. In the meantime, Manus, we have to contend with UBS saying that the next move might be a hike. Six and a half percent. Could you imagine if they raise rates to six and a half percent? They think, say it would take equities down by 10 to 15 percent. I think that's generous. And I think the market can barely imagine that. We're starting to, though. It's in the conversation and it is impacting markets. It is the higher rates, the geopolitical risk. All of that is adding to a much stronger dollar. Let me show you what it's doing this morning, man, is because it is just bulldozing over all of the emerging markets. We've had Indonesia feel the need to respond. You've had the officials over at the Bank of Korea needing to respond. You had China, which had a weaker fixing, which certainly didn't help things. And you have the yen at its lowest since 1990. It's stabilizing this morning, but you still have a dollar that's up two tenths of 1%. Yields continue to march higher. We're not six and a half percent like UBS is talking about, but we are at 4.6%, the highest level since November. It was a stronger consumer, the hedonism of the consumer that continues to spend with retail sales yesterday, much stronger that really sent yields on another path higher. 43 basis points we've moved up over the past month. Brent crude takes a breather. We're back below $90 a barrel, down by about a third of 1%. As Octavio Morenzi put it, he expects Israel to have a measured response, which is maybe why this market has been more calm, because that is the wide expectation for most investors. And this equity market, which took a bruising yesterday, finally the stock market reacted to what was going on in the bond market, up 14 basis points on the tens at one juncture, ending up eight basis points. So finally, uh, the equity market down 1.7% on the NASDAQ, down 1.2% on the S&P 500. We're trying to find some kind of stability uh, this morning. But you're right, it is that toxic combination between, uh, you know, houses like UBS flying a kite of 6.5%, rates may need to go to 6.5%, for stockflation, in other words, inflation that will not yield at the 2.5% level. Uh, equities in Europe, what you've got is Europe and Australasia all playing that catch-up game to the demolition that took place in the U.S. equity market yesterday. Uh, commodities and basic resources are under pressure in Europe this morning. The real concern there is about, there you go, down 2.63% is the China data. Yes, it was good uh, pumping on all cylinders in January and February, and the growth rate will be above 5%. But... It is what happened to the dissipation of the retail sales and a number of the other components in March. And that is where we're seeing a bit of a pressure on the commodity side. I mean, I said, do you think I have to eat my own hat? Because last week I said, this feels just like 2022 in that the trade, it's commodities and it's tech. But it's remarkable to see finally, Manus, finally yields go higher and there's some sort of impact to big tech. Finally, NVIDIA You've falls. You've got a kind of relish in your voice that fi fi <laughs> finally there's like, you know. It a bit of bloodletting in the equity market because yields popped. Well, I mean, the, the resilience of equities had been remarkable. And sure, maybe earnings are going to be great and justify it all. But in the meantime, 
How can there not be any movement? We finally got it yesterday with what? 1.7% sell off in the NASDAQ? You can almost smell the 2% retracement that we haven't had for quite some yes. time. Okay, let's just reset in terms of, I mentioned China uh, when I was doing the equity market check, where the economy grew faster than expected with some signs of challenges ahead. Jill Decees joins us from Hong Kong to break this down in more detail. So Jill, January, February, good. March, less resplendent. Good and bad news. Differentiate for me. Yes, uh, Manis, that's pretty much the story here. I mean, we had that headline uh, quarterly GDP figure up 5.3% year on year for the first quarter, but then obviously those March numbers didn't really look that great. I mean, those retail sales growth figures in particular, really missing expectations there, guys. I mean, that was a, that was a pretty big oof today, along with uh, weaker than expected industrial output figures as well, um, which I think is pretty concerning just because, um, you know, we had been following sort of this two-track uh, economic recovery story in China, where um, factory production has actually been pretty strong through the first part of the year, um, while well, it's consumption that um, obviously remains weak. I think that what that's ultimately telling us is that there's still um, some pretty big concerns about the economy right now. Maybe that overall GDP figure for uh, the first quarter of the year was strong enough to keep us on track for this about 5% growth target that Beijing has set for the entire year, but there may be more uh, that Beijing ultimately needs to do in some fashion to support the economy to make sure that it can regain so momentum as we get into the rest of the year. Jill, often the silver lining for poor data is at least this will get some sort of policy response and help support things. Is, can the same be said this time around? Well, Danny, I think this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because uh, again, that um, that economic growth, uh, that GDP uh, number for the first quarter of the year was strong enough. I think the concern among economists, analysts here is, uh, is that enough to say, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the central bank, uh, maybe policymakers in Beijing are just going to be complacent for now. I think that's really kind of the worry. Um, ultimately, though, I think the other concern that they have is that the central bank in particular on the monetary policy policy side is really just pretty constrained in what they can ultimately do. I mean, especially with this idea of we don't know exactly when the Fed is going to start cutting rates, given how resilient the U.S. economy has been. There's concern about that widening um, disparity between what economic or what monetary policy in China looks like versus what it looks like in the U.S. I mean, China continuing to cut rates, especially if the Fed isn't going to start cutting rates until well after June or so, I think creates a gap that they might be uh, too uncomfortable with to follow through on. Well, one release valve is the currency. And to a certain extent, I like what Westpac said, the PBOC is bound to reality of a stronger dollar. But what did the PBOC do in the fixing? Yeah, I mean, I think that at that point, it's really that quote that captures it. It's just the reality that so they were the, the fixing was weaker than expected. So they let it um, tip up to, to um, a, a bit above 7.1 to the dollar. So ultimately, yes, a lot of analysts are saying, look, uh, the dollar is really strong. There's a lot of onshore <laughs> demand for the dollar. And so, um, the PB, uh, the, so, so the PBOC is ultimately just going to have to acknowledge that uh, the yuan is going to be a bit weaker. Um, but what it ultimately wants to do here is it wants to manage, um, you, know, sort, you know, sort of that weakness a bit sort of let it um you know sort of let it go lower but uh, make sure that it's sort of carefully managing that a little bit more so that's why you may be seeing that uh, weaker than expected fixing today all right jill thank you very much for that jill disis in hong kong joining us now is sonia martin head of fx and monetary policy at dz bank sonia great to see you this morning look while chinese policymakers might have said a weaker fix the rest of emerging market fx is in the grips of a much stronger dollar. If you look at the scores on the board this morning, EMFX at a two-year low. South Korea is jawboning after the won fell to a two-year weakness versus the dollar. The Bank of Indonesia had to step up its support. We're now talking about 160 on dollar yen. Are we about to enter a period of mass intervention versus the dollar? Well, yes, obviously the dollar has been very strong and this has happened, I think, mainly actually on the back of the higher than expected CPI data from the US. I think it's actually not that much of a geopolitical move uh, because that doesn't quite fit with the movements we've seen elsewhere. So I think it's mainly the US higher rates going to be higher for longer story that's driving the dollar higher. And yes, that is giving some measure of concern to uh, other countries. I mean, you've mentioned Indonesia, but of course, we're also looking at the BOJ and the, and the Minister of Finance of Japan, who are undoubtedly very worried about the, the 
recent decline of the yen and aren't going to be happy with what they're seeing. Um, having said all of that, and while we might see some intervention here, um, I think the big question is, can this dollar strength last? I mean, I, I would just remind people that, you know, over the last year, we have flip-flopped between investors being very, very bullish on the dollar just to then turn around and become quite negative. I mean, we had a conversation, uh, I think, last year about is the end of the dollar era near. I mean, let's not forget that happened too. And I'm, I'm not sure if we should read too much into what we're seeing right now in the market reaction to the, let's face it, only slightly higher than expected CPI reading, um, you know, for the time being. But the rates market has asphyxiated. I, I, you know, it's convulsed. It, I, and yesterday was another prime example of that on the, on the back of those hot retail sales. Um, it, you know, the dollar is being driven by geopolitics undoubtedly over the very, very near term, but rates are a real pillar of that. When you begin to see houses like UBS talking about 6.5%, Torsten Slock at Apollo, no rate cuts, and reaffirming that yesterday. It's, it's, it's amazing um, how divergent we are in terms of where we will go. You still believe that they will be able to do rate cuts. Why? Well, uh, again, let's look back just a few weeks, a couple of months when people were talking about the Fed cutting by 175 basis points, and everyone was really convinced that was inevitable, and we have come back from that. So what it really comes down to is the inflation development. And yes, the CPI was higher than expected, only marginally, but yes, disappointing nevertheless. But the key figure to look for is not the CPI, but the PCE, because that's what the Fed is looking at. And the next PCE data is coming out at the end of April. And I think that's going to be crucial for the Fed. If the Fed, if there, if there is evidence with the PCE that inflation pressures are going to be more persistent, then yes, I would agree that the likelihood that the Fed will start cutting uh, in June, which is our current call, you know, will decrease significantly and they'll have to push back. I totally agree with that. Chances that they're not going to cut at all, well, that would take a much more persistent inflation picture and potentially a pickup in inflation, maybe as a result of rising energy prices, geopolitics, etc. But it's a very difficult time for the Fed, who are probably watching the data like a hawk uh, and are going to probably decide sort of very much from meeting to meeting what they're going to do depending on circumstances. And Sonia, this push and pull, as you say, it's what's moving the dollar, not geopolitics. You write that investors don't even want to imagine the fallout that would result from a further escalation. And that's why markets have been trading on a benign, quote unquote, good outcome. If the dollar strength we're seeing at the moment doesn't even take into account geopolitics, should there be real escalation that the market has to grapple with? What happens to the dollar? Well, I think we would see a much more stronger dollar in that scenario, driven for one by safe haven flows, um, but also, of course, by expectations that in that scenario, the Fed would definitely not be able to cut rates anymore because we'd get you know, a push in inflation through energy prices, et cetera. So that would, you know, be a double whammy. Um, if you then add a potential election win for Donald Trump into the equation and you end up, I think, with a much stronger dollar, at least for the, for, for quite a while. Um, you know, it's much more difficult when you look at the rate picture because in terms of interest rates, I mean, yes, high inflation, less cuts would mean that U.S. yields should remain higher, but then you'd have the safe haven argument that would stand against that. So it's more ambivalent when you look at the rates in that scenario, but definitely for the dollar, I think it would result in a significant strengthening. And then I would, you know, we would definitely be looking at euro dollar towards parity. Well, let's see uh, where those next shoes uh, drop on the geopolitical front. I'm looking at dollar yen, 154.51. Every time you turn around, there's a new red line in the sand for the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance. You say they are undoubtedly prepared for intervention, but it will take it will be taking a risk going against the trend. And yeah. timing is everything. If you're going to jawbone a currency, which is what they've done, but they haven't put their money where their mouth is. I mean, I'm seeing in, in my inbox, 160 is the new red line. So what is it that triggers the MOF to actually intervene in the face of a pretty virulent U.S. dollar? You know, the BOJ and the MOF are going to be really, really careful not to be seen to draw that particular line in the sand because it always comes back to haunt them because then people think that this is where the line is going to be drawn and next time we're there, everyone is going to expect them to intervene, right? There isn't a particular level. I think it's about the... the, the uh, dynamics of the move, disorderly markets is the term that they often use. I think that's going to be the focus. And the only thing the BOJ and the MOF currently have going for them is the fact that this move is looking increasingly speculative and you have seen speculative long positions in dollar yen rise massively. So that's something that's going to work in their favor if they intervene because they're going to catch a lot of people on the wrong foot.
So then you might see some sort of short covering should they actually intervene. Sonia, just to, to, just to end things here, in this environment where we're talking about maybe the Fed can't cut, maybe the next move is a hike, Euro dollar, you say, goes to parity if there is an expansion of the conflict. But could euro dollar go to parity if we're in an environment where the ECB, as they've committed to, is going to be cutting quicker and more severely than the Fed? That depends on the dif uh, difference, to be honest. I mean, if, the, if it's just a question of the ECB moving in the summer and the Fed moving in September, I think that's not going to be the major mover because that's already priced in. I think you'd have to, if you're looking for euro dollar parity, at the very least, you would need to have Fed no cuts from the Fed and cutting from the ECB 50, 75 basis points. I think you probably need that divergence because that's not priced into the market yet uh, if we're going to reach parity. Okay, two very different scenarios uh, for parity. Uh, Sonia, thank you so much. Sonia Martin of DZ Bank. Coming up on the show, luxury is the focus. LVMH prepares to report its sales results. We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg Brief. You're looking live at the principal room coming up later today in interview with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief with me, Manis Cranny, and Danny Berger alongside me. Over to Europe now, LVMH is set to show a muted start to the year in the first quarter results when they hit the tape. Let's bring in our Bloomberg opinion columnist, Andrea Felstead. So, the rich, have they stopped shopping and the aspirational or reluctant? Contextualize LVMH for me. Andrea, good morning. Morning. Um, yes, you're right. This is going to be a muted quarter. When you compare with it a year ago, um, we had China just reopening. Chinese shoppers were out revenge spending. Um, the US hadn't slowed to the extent it did later in the year. So if, if you look at the, at the, at the numbers, um, uh, the consensus is around 3% organic uh, sales growth for both um, fashion and leather goods and the overall group. Both of those uh, in the first quarter of 2023 were in the high teens and they, they came in roughly twice what analysts had expected. I guess then, Andrea, if we see results that don't show up to expectations, is it normalization or is it a large scale slowdown? So far, it's been normalization and, you know, the industry is up against very tough comparatives from a year ago. Investors are expecting things to improve as the year goes on, so the comparisons get easier. They're also looking for a turnaround in the US. But, you know, we're yet to see those. We've also got an election in the US. What's that going to do uh, to confidence? The good news is luxury tends to be correlated with stock markets, with crypto. Both of those have been pretty strong, but we haven't yet seen that crucial turnaround in the US. I mean, it's a battle for supremacy, isn't it? I mean, do you think things will improve for Louis Vuitton L later on? We're looking at a cracking story this morning on the Bloomberg. Hermes to surpass Vuitton's biggest brand. That's according to City. But I mean, when you look at these two brands, they are, they are different in, in some ways in terms of the product range. Um, but is that a battle that Louis Vuitton wants to, to sort of take on against Hermes? They do it on a daily basis. But do you think Hermes can trump LVMH? Um, I think they're slightly different. Um, one thing that we've seen over the last year, it's all about selling to the 1%. If you can sell to the super wealthy, Hermes, Brunello, Cuccinelli, um, you, you're doing better than if you are selling to the aspirational luxury consumer, which has retrenched. Now, uh, Louis Vuitton's got a bit of both. You know, it's got very high price products, but it's also got a lot of lower price bags. So it's it's got it's you know it's it's got a bit of both really. Yeah. Andrea, thank you so much. Looking forward to those earnings later today. Andrea Felstead, we'll see whether uh, crypto plumbing new recent highs helps everyone afford that Hermes bag. Okay, Manus, a quick check on your bonds. I guess if you're investing in the bond market, maybe another story. Yields are at the highest since November for your tenure. We're over 4.6%. It gained eight basis points yesterday. 
UBS puts it really well, Manis, that the next move might not be a cut. It might be a hike if things stay as is where inflation is stubborn. I, I mean, I was reading through that that piece and it's almost like stuckflation. So mm. th th they're, they're worried about inflation being turgid around two and a half, two point yeah. seven five. It's the no landing. It is the no landing situation, but it's no landing with an even more toxic scenario, which is rate hike six and a half percent. Do you think equities would tank by more than 10 to 15 percent because that's what that note probably says. not and probably flattened. equities will be fine man it's probably equities will be on phase everyone will be buying nvidia she won't be happy <laughs> she really 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 won't be happy everybody be long nvidia buy that dip you can just imagine your inbox filling up with a with the notes. Oh yeah, absolutely. But the rest of the bond market follows along with the U.S. Yields moving both in the U.K. and Germany was what 10 basis points higher. Yeah, it's pretty in the mighty. UK yesterday. Move. Yeah, and so we see that follow on today. But of course, that divergence it needs to get pretty big, says Sonia, Sonia Martin, if we're going to see something like euro parity. Okay, coming up, Live Nation falling as the DOJ brings down the hammer on Ticketmaster. Donald Trump's first criminal trial has officially started with the judge ruling that the jurors will be allowed to hear evidence about the former president's alleged affair with the ex-Playboy model. Bloomberg's Kelly Lyons reports from outside the Manhattan courthouse. It was a historic moment as the first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president got underway here in Lower Manhattan. Donald Trump has been charged with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in relation to hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels in the days ahead of the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the charges and in the hallways of the courtroom on Monday suggested that he views this as political persecution, election interference, something designed to keep him off the campaign trail. It will indeed keep him off the campaign trail as he is required to be here in person in court for each day of this trial, which could last between six to eight weeks or even longer. They had a number of procedural motions they had to work through when this trial began, including a motion uh, to recuse on the part of the judge, which he denied, and a motion, uh, several motions related to what could or could not be submitted into evidence. Once they got through all of that, that is when jury selection began, and it's going to be very hard work. More than 96 uh, or 96 percent potential jurors were brought into the courtroom and more than half of them said that they could not be unbiased or impartial in uh, judging this case because of the familiarity of Donald Trump, not just as a former president, but of course the current presumptive Republican nominee. So jury selection will have to continue. It's a process that could potentially take several weeks. Proceedings will begin again Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. And of course, this could have much consequence for the 2016 election. Bloomberg and Morning Consult have done a poll of the seven key swing states likely to decide the election back in January that found more than half of voters in those states said they would not vote for Donald Donald Trump if he were to be convicted of a crime. In Lower Manhattan, I'm Kaylee Lines, Bloomberg News. All right, let's get you set up for your trading day now. A look at what's ahead. Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, they're going to be reporting results before the bell. Then we're going to get numbers for U.S. housing starts. Those will come out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Then Fed Chair Powell will be delivering remarks at 1.15 p.m. Eastern. So, Manis, let's see if that makes a difference to yields already above 4.6%. Yep, uh, we'll keep an eye on that yield to equity relationship. Some micro movers for you. The Justice Department may file an antitrust complaint as soon as next month, aimed at forcing Live Nation to spin off the ticketing business. The stock down 6.75%. The CEO of Stellantis is getting pushback for his $39 million pay package. The car maker pursues deep job cuts those savings are there. And Coinbase down six tenths of 1%. Will I make it back to the seat before we go? <laughs> no. Pro probably not. In the meantime, Panish, the market continues to move. It is a stronger dollar. It is yields higher reaction to a stronger economy.